six. I'm going to finish up what I started this morning. How many just, just love when God does stuff, be on the altars? And I just love that stuff. I, just, I, I like sweating at church. I think it's really cool. And, uh, you know, I just playing and jumping and singing and sweating and spitting. I love it. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Love it. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll go there in just a second. Ethan, we're, we're going to 10 and 11. Actually, we're going 10 through 12, but just hang on for a minute. Amen. And uh, that is not a target, so please don't throw anything at the screen. Is this going to come up? Just a second, just a second. Hang on. All right. Here we go. This morning I talked to you about no backing up and going forward and reaching for the prize of the high calling, right? This morning we talked about it's okay to look to the back and to make a memorial of something and remember what God did and what He did in our lives. I thought that's fine and dandy. Uh, how many of you remember when you got saved? If you can remember, uh, you may not remember the exact date. You may not remember where. And all, I mean, you may remember but who was preaching all that stuff. You may not remember all that stuff, but you do know this. Uh, you do. You do remember getting saved, right? Okay. And so I know that a lot of times people don't remember, and they think, oh, "I don't remember the exact date I got saved." And so, listen, it doesn't matter. You just know you did. Amen. And so don't worry about it. Listen, uh, I don't remember the exact date that I came to the Lord. I don't remember the exact date at all. I have no clue. I just remember we were in a revival with somebody. That's all I remember. And uh, it's in the early '80s. That's all I remember. And I don't remember who I don't remember what he preached, I don't remember who was preaching, I don't have a clue. I just know I had to get saved once I needed to breathe. And that's all I that's all I knew. And so I came to the altar and got saved. But listen, there's, there's no time to back up. We have we have we've got to go forward. We have to go forward. There's nothing wrong with remembering things. But use that to fuel yourself to go forward. Propel yourself forward with what happened in the past. But what if the past is bad? Don't remember that stuff. Yeah. Remember how God brought you out of that stuff. Don't, don't linger in the bat in the past to where you're you're so uh, you're so handicapped and so handcuffed that you can't get to a future because of your past. Don't don't ever do that. Don't let the devil bind you so hard in, in the past that you can't reach the future. Don't ever look so far in your back in your back behind you that you don't see the sunlight. Amen. See, that's a great example here because. It, the sun sets in the west and it rises in the east. And as the sun, as the sun is setting, I can still see the horizon. But, but in my past, I, I have something coming on. In 24 hours, I'll have another sunrise. Amen? And so I get to see something else coming in. I'm always reaching for the sun but never getting there. Does that make sense to anybody? I always can see to the next one, to the next level, to the next level. And so don't ever let your past define your future. Amen. Go for whatever God has got for you to do. And go do it with all your might. Be who God's called you to be without, without even worrying about what anybody says or does. It doesn't matter what they say. Just go for it. Amen. But we've got to go for it, church. Amen. Stretch and reach. Reach and, and, and just grab hold of everything that we can. What was that old beer commercial? Go for the gusto. That was in the 70s. Go for the gusto. I don't remember what beer company it was. That's probably, that's probably not very fitting in the church service. <laughs> but go for the gusto. And some of y'all sinners will remember what it was. But we were, we we're trying to, amen? That means just go for it. Go for everything. Go give it out all you've got. Reach for that, reach for that golden ring. Reach for it. Go for it. And so as a church, I want us to reach for everything that God has for us. I don't want us to settle. I, I see every now and then a, a pattern that we get comfortable. I don't like comfortable in church. I know we have padded pews. I know we have carpet. I know we have air conditioning. I know we have heat. I know we have ceiling fans. Hallelujah. I'm talking about comfortable in your spirit. There ought to be that divine go in you. Burn it up, dear. Sorry. The gates of hell shall not prevail against this. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Listen to me. I want you to understand something from me. Jesus said, go. That is a divine go to all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. That is in me. That divine go is in me. 
That the vine stretching forth to every person that I can reach. That the vine reaching out to the world is in me. I have no other option. I have no other. I have, listen, I don't have a plan B. This is it. We must go and reach and stretch and go forward. We have to go. Our, our approach has to change the way we do it. But still yet, the approach has to be to reach the, the lost for Jesus Christ. The, the approach has to be. The, yeah, you can't. You can't censor what God's called you to do. Amen. You've got to be who He's called you to be. Ephesians 6 and 10, Brother Ethan, please. Thank you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Go back to verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Church, we need to be a strong church. Amen. Amen. Our secret weapon is unity. Amen. We can't divide over stuff. You know what we can't do? Talk behind each other's back about stuff. Oh! If I could... I would pray that the tongue fall out of the next person. <laughs> hmm. You want to make me mad? That will make me mad. I absolutely detest that job. And I could use another word that's not fitting in church. <laughs> I absolutely detest that job. I hate it with a passion. I hate backbiting, tail-bearing, yeah. gossiping. I hate that worse than any. You can almost lie to me and not make me as mad as that joke. Why? Because you tear down the person and you tear down the church and it makes me mad. Yeah. I hate it. And so that is one of the wiles of the devil. So we must be strong. Strong. And the only way that we are strong is if we are unified together as a unit. Amen. Hear me. Don't tell everybody. Boy, I'm going to trouble say that. Come on. Go ahead. Okay, never mind. Don't tell everybody what you're going to do and not make it public for what the church is doing. What do you mean? Don't tell everybody, hey, uh, I'm going to do this. But you never say anything about what the church is doing unless you're involved. Yeah. 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 Really? Let me, let, me share, let me clear that up a little. Is that clear about If you're involved in popcorn making, everybody come eat my popcorn. But if you're not involved in popcorn making, I wouldn't go there and eat popcorn. Maybe the theater has better popcorn. But if you're involved in it, it's the biggest thing ever in the history of the world. But it's supposed to be the church, no matter who's making the popcorn. Amy did a great job making popcorn. She had them popping it up, baby. She had it going on. She ran out. But that was 24 batches. How many sacks were in a batch? A bunch. <laughs> she didn't pop popcorn for three hours. Amen. I think mean, we are good church. We get popcorn. We didn't get any popcorn. We're going to the kingdom all next week. I said, so, hear me. Listen, we're supposed to this thing wide open. Anyway, listen to me. So hear me for just a second. That's an inside joke. I don't even know. Okay. And so that's me and David. That's an inside joke, me and David. Okay. Now hear me for just a second. It is about this body. It is about us. What are we doing? Not what are you doing. What are we doing? Where, where are we going? How are we getting there? It's about us. It's about us as a unit. It's about the unity of a church that's moving it forward, going through, doing things for God. It's about, listen, I, and I know we have to distinguish because we have different departments, and I'm so thankful, and I, I don't know when we're ready to announce what we're going to announce, but uh, we'll do it sometime before I leave. But I have three weeks before I leave to go to Israel. Okay? Three weeks for today. I'm leaving, going to Israel. And I hate to fly. 
Not because I'm scared. That's just uncomfortable. And it's a long flight, baby. It's just uncomfortable to me to be like, mm, I just hate it. Yeah. So I have to get up and walk around. Hopefully, I'm going to try to get an aisle seat. I've got to walk around a little bit. I can't do it. I can't sit there. We flew, we flew to Orlando. It's two hours. I'm about to go nuts. I can't just... Let's... I'm ADHD. I probably need some Ritalin or something so I can go. I just can't sit there, man. I just can't sit there and just deal with that. Oh, so anyway. So, so I have three weeks before we go to Israel. Right excited to get some stuff into your spirit before I go, because listen, you, you have 10 days without me, you'll be blessed beyond measure, okay? 10 days without me, because I get back the 9th of December. Now listen, I'm not going to leave you out there just hanging. We have some great guys going to come preach for you and, and do some stuff for you, and, and some guys I trust that are going to preach for you and all that stuff, but I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is the disunity of the church. Stay together. Keep it together. Stay as a unit. Stay loving each other. How, listen, I don't want to sin against God for my failing to pray for you because if I pray for you, I won't talk about you. Sorry, my nose is driving crazy. Sorry. Listen, don't look at my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord for the power of his, and the power of his might. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. How? Go to verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God. Be prepared for all things. Can I share with you that the devil doesn't say, oh, he's got a helmet of salvation, I'll, I'll uh, hit him in the head. No. He's got to show the faith, okay, uh, I'll throw something at him so he can't block it. No. He looks for the cheek of your armor that you don't have. What do you not have on? What is it that you don't have your back, exactly? What is it that you don't have on? And now listen, some of us that are saved still need some protection because we leave some of our armor at home. Sometimes we still leave some of our protection at home. And then we get an attack of the devil and we fight and he, and he finds our weakness. And then all of a sudden we're in trouble because we're getting wounded. <coughs> we're getting hurt. So you have to put on the whole armor of God. Be prepared for all things. Doing battle with a missing armor, armor will get you wounded and bleeding. If, you have, if you're missing something, you'll be wounded and you'll be bleeding. But here's the cool thing. Jesus paid it all. He'll, he'll heal you. He'll put you. He'll make you right with Him. But listen, put on the whole armor of God that you're able to stand. Stand. Not fall, but stand. Not be that weak person that goes crumbles every time somebody says something, but somebody who will stand. That's not, that, listen, every time the devil comes against you, doesn't mean you've got to crumble. When are you going to stand on your own two feet? When are you going to believe God said what his word says about you? When are you going to stop letting somebody say something to you and you crumble? When are you going to stand up and say, I, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, you lying devil, and you have no power, no authority over me. I'm, a, I'm the head and I'm not the tail. I'm a mother and I'm not the king. I'm blessed going in, I'm blessed going out. I'm a blessed in my basket, I'm blessed in my store. I'm a, I'm a child of the king. It may not be revealed, but I am, but right now I am a child of God. That's who I am. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, go to 12 for me, please. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You're not fighting against your brethren or your sister. You're not fighting against each other. It's the thing that comes against you. It's the spirit of the, of the devil that comes against you. Listen, we're not fighting each other or, or those of uh, this present world. Listen, I'm not fighting against the sinner. I'm not against them. I'm for them. I'm here for the sinner and the lost. I'm here to be a representation of Jesus Christ and what he can do in your life. Listen, do you not realize that's who you are? You're a representative of Jesus. We're supposed to see Jesus in you. Let them see you in me. Amen. You can't do that 
when you're being a jerk. I mean, I have a fitting word either. I don't know. But it's a truthful word. I said, I, I'm, supposed to be, I'm supposed to represent Christ in everything that He's done. Yes. I'm supposed to represent Him. And I want to represent Him well. The story goes from Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias, if you don't know, is a, is a minister. He's from India, if you can tell by the name, right? And he goes to universities and he debates against secular humanists. He debates against, uh, I don't know what they're called, uh, agnostics. Those that are trying to, all those young people who go to college with a head full of mush, and they're trying to re -indoctrinate, indoctrinate them. And he goes and he debates against all these people. And he told a story about a missionary who went to Russia. And the, and the missionary went to Russia and there were some people in a village up in the mountains. And, and they went up there to witness to them. And the guy who was the leader of the little sect of people up there said, we don't need anything to do with your God or anything that has to do with just Jesus. <coughs> Because your people killed my brother. Something happened and his brother was killed by Christians for some reason. And he catch that brother's story. He said, I have, I have no use for you Christian people. I have no use for you whatsoever. Because you misrepresent, misrepresent who you are. You say that Jesus loves me, you say this and you say that. But it was you who killed my brother. The missionary was a very wise man. And this is what he said. Sir, I noticed, that, I noticed your coat and your hat and your boots. He said, yeah. He said, so what? What about him? He said, if you were to go, if, if another man was to go to the, the other village and kill everybody in the village wearing your coat, your boots, and your hat, would that make you a murderer? He said, no. It wouldn't. He said, but they would identify you because of your coat, your boots, and your hat as a murderer. Right. And so they would, they would say, not right that you are a murderer and that you, sir, need to be put to death. So the missionary was very wise in this, in this conversation. <coughs> and so the, 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 the man began to let this man come and talk to him. And let him come and talk to him about Jesus and begin to let him hold meetings in their little village that they had. And many, many people came to the Lord and even the, the man whose brother was killed eventually came to the Lord and was saved. And as the missionary was leaving, the man walked up to him and said, I just want you to know you wear his coat well. What does that mean? He represented Jesus well. And I said the same thing you guys just said, Why? What wisdom to use a coat, hat, and boots to enter into a village. And most of the village got saved and they know the Lord today because one man wore his coat well. So how about us? Do we wear his coat well? That's a story, it's an old story. When I got to, uh, yeah, we got ordained in 2000, one or two, uh, one or two, whatever it was, and as in my ordination service, and they asked us to testify. And my testimony in 2002, I believe it was 2002, was simple. I just want to wear his coat well. I want to be who he has called me to be. I want to represent Jesus well. But what does that mean? That means that I can't discuss you behind your back. I can't I can't bring you down to raise, to raise me up. I can't talk about these sorry, rotten, dirty sinners as though I never was one. I can't talk about people being lost now to know better when I didn't know any better and I didn't know better. That makes sense to you? I act like I didn't know better, but I knew better. How, how in the world, Sister Ramona, how in the world can I look you in the face, stand up here and look you in the face, knowing 
that after lunch today I just ripped you. But people do it all the time. How can I say that I love you to your face and then behind you rip you to shreds? You're a liar and you're full of the devil. I don't care if you get mad or not. You get mad at me if you want to. Full of the devil. Because only the devil is the accuser of the brethren. That's what the Bible says. Now, I'm not saying that people don't do things wrong. And I'm not saying that I'm going to not going to have some come to Jesus meetings because I am. Because we have some things we have to deal with. But hear me for just a second. Hear me for just a second. That, as you can tell, is a pet peeve of mine. I lived through it here. And I refuse to let you live through it. Get mad if you want. I lived through that junk from the time I was a little kid until I was 46 years old. And y'all over here know exactly what I'm talking about. You might as well give me a good amen. Amen. Some of y'all wouldn't hear that amen. That's all right. Is it true? Somewhat. The Kelly ain't gonna answer me. <laughs> it's true. No, oh, did you really? <laughs> what a shot. <laughs> Everything I preach, they talk about in class. That's a great thing. I love it. I love it. Because we're on the same page. I love it. I'm going to share some more things and I'll quit. I promise. Give me 15. Uh, give me 10 minutes. 10 minutes. The devil finds a weak spot. And he exploits it. You ever heard of the old expression, misery loves company? That's because the devil loves misery and he'll suck everybody he can in with it. He'll suck you into that. Have you ever started around and then all of a sudden you find yourself in the middle of this conversation? How did I get in this junk? And then you got to get out of it. Amen? The devil will find a weak spot and he exploits it. He'll look over and see if you're ready for battle. Are you ready for battle? Because I'm going to tell you right now, you better get ready for battle. How many of you are you going through something right now? Come on. You're going through something right now. <laughs> you know why? Because the devil wants you dead. He doesn't want you hurt. He doesn't want you sick. He doesn't want you in the hospital. He wants you dead. Dead and gone. Bye. History. See ya. You know why? Because he hates your very existence. You know why? Can I share your way? Can I, I just try to teach a little, this little teaching moment here? Because you are fashioned and made in the image of God. And anything He can do to mar that image, that's what He tries to do. If He can beat you and make you and break you and cause you to quit and cause you to fail, He mars the image that He detests and that's God because you're made in His image. Listen, I don't know if you know this or not, but the devil's not a little guy in a red jumpsuit with a pitchfork in his head. He was formed as an angel. An archangel. A beautiful angel. The angel of light. He doesn't come to you going, eh, the devil. <laughs> he comes to you like, Ooh. Yes, he's a fallen angel. Yes, of course he is. But that's not scary in the movies. And so he comes as, as form as an angel of light. So you have to be ready for the battle. You have to be ready for battle. And so you've got to, how are you ready for battle? Because you better get ready because you're going, you are going to have to have a battle. And listen, when you're covered by the blood, when you're covered by the blood of Jesus, when you're covered by that precious, precious blood, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me because one day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know it was that precious blood for me. It's that blood of Jesus that covers us. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us the armor. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us salvation. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us faith. It's the blood of Jesus that gives righteousness. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us our people It's the blood of Jesus that gives us the soul of the Lord of God. It's Him and Him alone. So why? Why, why, why? Please understand me. Why, why, why? Do we cast it aside? So easily. Oh, but you don't know. Yes, I do. Cast it aside. 
It's the blood of Jesus that keeps me ready for battle. It's the blood of Jesus that keeps me prepared for the battle against the devil and not against my brother and sister, but against the devil. It's the blood of Jesus that helps me and keeps me. It's the blood of Jesus that even though I'm going through a sickness or a disease or, or I'm going through a financial problem or I'm going through an emotional scarring, if I'm going through something in my life, it's the blood of Jesus that gets me through. Listen, I can talk to you. I can give you all the answers that I have. I can, I can, I can tell you what scriptures to read. I can take you and let's sit you in the office and let's talk about it. And there's nothing wrong with that. And hallelujah. But it, until you get the blood of Jesus into your life, listen, you're going to go through some stuff. I, I'm sorry that you're going to go through it, but you are going to go through some stuff. You're never going to get through this life unscathed. A, they, didn't, they didn't invent band-aids for no reason. You're going to get scratched. You're going to get bumped. You're going to get bruised. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get knocked in the head. You're going to get, listen, if you ever rode a bike, you had a scratch and a bruise. If you ever done anything besides sit in the house, you got scratched, you got bruised. If you sit, if you sit in the house, you may hit your elbow on the arm of the chair. Something's going to happen in your life. You're going to get bumped and bruised. But the answer is to simply have someone to take care of your wounds. I've said it before for a long time. I want to say it again. A wound will kill you. A scar just reminds you of what you've been through. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen? How many have a scar? Yes. Wow, 100%. Who would have thought? Does that scar hurt? It did when it was a wound. When it bled when it got infected, when you're in the hospital and you got staph infection in your wound, when they had to clean it out and pack it, when they had to drain it, when they had to take care of it, when they put antibiotics in it and sew it up, it hurt you and it could have killed you. You know what killed my dad? Infection in his body. Infection. It wasn't the blockage. The blockage just caused the infection. That's what killed my dad. Because infection in a church, in your life, in your body, will kill you. It will kill you. It's not the scar. Listen, had my dad gone through surgery and come out of it, he would have a scar from surgery. But it wasn't the scar that killed him. It was the infection under the scar. We have wounds. That makes sense. We have wounds. But let God heal those wounds. I can't heal them for you. Sister Paula, we can pray for everybody and we can line everybody up and knock everybody down. But only God can heal your wound. Only God can save your life. Only God can bind that thing up in your life. Emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever. Only He can change your attitude. Only He can change your life. Only He can change your outlook. My outlook is so positive. Boom. I see what we're going. Man. I wish I could just take that door out and put a window I know where God's leading us. And I know where God's taking me. I just want you to go. I want you to go with me. I want you to understand what, listen. Do you trust me? Yes. I hope you do. Man. We got quiet. Because I know where God's leading this place. Guys, listen to me. I know this is nuts. Listen, there's probably more people here in this church tonight than any other church in Seminole, Oklahoma, and nice yeah. yeah. That's not an exaggeration. There's 96 people here. I counted you. The doors were singing. I counted you. There's 96 people on a Sunday night, you bunch of radicals. <laughs> Come to church on Sunday night. There's 70, 60 something. 
in here on Wednesday, and I don't know what we had in the back and up the street. I have no idea. On a Wednesday, Brother Dean. Wow! What? That's unheard of, Brother Jimmy. Nobody does that. Amen. You know, I ask the question I get at every convention and everything I go to. What are y'all doing? Did you say you We have church. We unlock the door and we turn the lights on and people show up. <laughs> It's an amazing thing. I, it's a, that's, and, I, and I know there's more to it than that, and I understand that. But that's the simple answer, is that if you don't have the doors open and the lights on, nobody's showing up. Pretty good chance, anyway. Somebody got to open the door. Somebody got to turn the lights on. Somebody got to make sure the floor's vacuumed and there's toilet paper and paper towels and glory. Somebody got to make sure all that stuff's going on. But you know what happens? Listen, how many, we have like 20 people for prayer meetings. You notice that? Yeah. <laughs> Used to be five of us. Yep. <laughs> and as that continues to grow, you know what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. You know what's in my mind? The nuclear explosion. <laughs> Mushroom, man. That's what's in my head. Poor anointing out of this place like it's never been poured out. Amen. I, I listen, I remember when, when God spoke to us, he said, Money's going to run through this place like water. Yeah. Come on. Dang, Jesus. I know that everybody in this place had a job and wants one for the month. Ah! So that's right. Do you understand how amazing that is? <laughs> Y'all didn't hear what Jesus He said, some of us have more than one. <laughs> we'll figure that lazy spirit out of me. God! <laughs> so, but you know how what a miracle that is? And we're just like, okay. That happens everywhere. What? <laughs> you know I get phone calls every week for food? Every week for money? Every week for this, every week for that, every something, something, something. There's some people out there hurting, man. <coughs> and I know we're enjoying a dollar ninety whatever for gas. Well, if you go out of the size of Seminole, the Seminole is still two forty nine for real gas because we live in a luxury town, I guess. And so we have to pay luxury prices for gas. But anyway, a dollar ninety at Walmart and Shawnee for hundred percent gas. I love it. Starting bucks fill up my van. Oh, isn't that awesome? But. But, for those people who depend on oil field jobs, they're hurting. They're hurting. They're hurting bad. And the companies that supply the oil field jobs and everything that's connected with it is suffering. And so for us to say, we're, we're employed, we make a living, we're blessed of God. What an amazing thing. Don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted ever. Why? Because we're blessed beyond measure. Because money will flow in here like water. How many of you turn the faucet on and the water comes out if you pay your bill, right? Or unless you're not, unless you steal it and you go turn it on anyway. But money flows like water. What does that mean? That means when we need it, it's there. It's just a tool. People get so hung up on money. Like it's the be all and end all of everything. It's just a tool. It's no, it's no different than a hammer. You know, if you're building something and you don't have a nail gun, which I have one, which are wonderful, by the way. But if you, if, uh, if you don't have a nail gun and you're trying to hammer something with the end of a screwdriver, <laughs> that's a hard nail to get in the wall. But if you have the right tool, pop, pop, done. Done. I know you studs can get one, but I don't. Okay. Okay. If you if you need to screw, if you put something together with screws, and you don't have a drill, and that takes a long time. How lazy are we now that we can't even go and screw, screw it? Because what? Man, it's in there. Yeah. Set the clutch thing. So it's done. So you're not stripping it out. You know what I'm saying? 
But the right tool for the right job. It's just a tool. It's all it is. It's just something that God yet lets us use when we need it. Amen? <coughs> Amen. I hope you got something out of this today. I pray you got something out of this. I really do. I don't ever want to just blame you. I don't ever want to waste your time. You hear me? Keep looking forward. Celebrate our past. And let's keep going forward. I'm so thankful for my past, but I know where God's taking us. Stand on your feet.